Uh, thank you again. You can see I took my jacket off because I want to have a relaxed, fun uh, week. And uh, maybe the next time I'll have my tie off if it's going well. Um, so I'm John Gallen, and before we get started, I would just like to introduce the faculty from NIH who've traveled with us to uh, participate in this course. And let me first introduce Dr. Laura Lee Johnson, if you would please stand up. You will get to know Dr. Johnson well. She's a statistician by training. She works for the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine and has played a very important role in designing this course, not only as it's being presented here, but back in the NIH. I'd next like to introduce Dr. Christine Grady. <laughs> Dr. Grady is the chair of the Department of Bioethics at the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, she was trained as a nurse and then went and got her PhD in bioethics and is now one of the leading authorities in the United States and indeed throughout the world. Let me now introduce Dr. Jerry Medikoff. <laughs> Dr. Medikoff was trained as a physician with some uh, training in ophthalmology but also is a lawyer and he has that unusual skill set and helps to run for the, runs the uh, United States Health and Human Services Department and the Office of Human Research Protections. So we're very lucky he is here. And last, let me introduce Dr. Paul Bakken, who's from the National Institute <laughs> of Drug Abuse and is a statistician who's going to help uh, in the uh, pr teaching of one of the most important and yet also difficult areas, biostatistics. And so you can see, because we have two statisticians here, how much important we attribute to this area. A, a, third, a fifth participant, Dr. Chuck Nathanson, uh, unfortunately had a family illness and cannot be here, but he has sent his lectures and they will be uh, presented uh, uh, later in the week if they work, and if not, we'll have alternative ways to teach this material. So if I could now uh, have, I have my first slide. So let me start off by introducing those of you who've never been to the US NIH, a little bit about the National Institutes of Health, because it's certainly phenomenally important in the United States and indeed throughout the world. Our mission is science in the pursuit of fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to extend healthy life and reduce illness and disability. Most of the money that comes to the National Institutes of Health, which is a lot, over $30 billion a year in US dollars, given by our Congress to support the science in the United States, goes to the universities, and we call that the extramural uh, uh, component of our funding. About 10 to, uh, it's actually 10 percent, uh, goes to the intramural component to support the research on the campus where we work, or about $3 billion. So we fund science across the United States, as well as around the globe, and indeed Brazil, where the arrow is, is one of our, uh, is the major recipient of funds uh, in the South American part of the world. So today, the major opportunities for biomedical research as we see it include to apply breakthrough knowledge and technologies to enhance understanding of biology and disease, to translate basic science into better treatments, and to improve health through uh, healthcare through science and sharpen the focus on global health. And the Ebola crisis is just one example of the latter. And to reinvigorate the whole biomedical research community for all the reasons you heard about in the introduction. So there are some special programs 
that have evolved very recently, uh, which uh, were really, uh, I think, invigorated as a result of Dr. Collins's visit here uh, earlier in the spring, including Science Without Borders, which is an NIH NICPK Visiting Fellows Program that supports postdocs from Brazil who come to the NIH. It's an NIH program with the Brazil National Council for Science and Technolo Technological Development that was started in 2012. It's part of the Brazil Science Without Borders Initiative and it includes support for one half of the stipend for people who participate for two years and travel costs back to Brazil each year. The NIH support includes a lit written commitment from the selected NIH investigator who partners, the balance of the NIH part of the partnership, and the postdoctoral training. And it's designed to train the next generation of biomedical researchers and encourages long-term long-term research partnerships. Let me show you a slide about the place I work, and many of us work who are here with you. It's called the NIH Clinical Center. This is the hospital at the National Institutes of Health. The picture is shown here. It's large. It's the largest building on our campus. It's the largest hospital in the world, totally dedicated to clinical research. And the focus is really threefold. To study the pathophysiology of disease, to study first in human with new therapeutics and new devices, and to study patients with rare diseases. You might say, why do we study patients with rare diseases? Well, they're not so rare. It's estimated that 20 to 30 million Americans have a rare disease. 300 million people worldwide have a rare disease. So this kind of research provides hope for those people. But more importantly, as William Harvey, the great English doctor from a long time ago once said, it's the study of rare diseases that give insights often into common diseases. And at lunchtime or at breaks, I'll love to tell you about that because I dedicate my life to studying rare diseases. Our mission is very simple, just like your mission, to try to do the best in science, the best in patient care, and the best in training. And training is truly a major emphasis, and the Clinical Center has trained many of the leaders of academic medicine throughout the United States and indeed abroad since it opened 60 years ago in 1953. And we have built a curriculum that we call our clinical research core curriculum. And it has three courses. One is the course you're receiving this week, Introduction to the Principles and Practices of Clinical Research. And you can see on this slide, a lot of people have taken this course. We have a second course on clinical pharmacology. That course often will travel to different places, could come to Rio de Janeiro if you want to have it. A third course, run by Dr. Grady, is on the ethical and regulatory aspects of human subjects research. You see a lot of people have taken these courses, and that's because we have taken advantage of long distance learning. So this figure just gives you a sense of where these courses have been offered you can see, if you look carefully, Brazil appears a few times. What we do is we broadcast these courses. If it's the right time zone, people take them live. If it's the wrong time zone, we record them and people look at them on the web whenever they want, next day. Communication with faculty is by email. They seem to work. I say that because the people who take these courses long distance do just as well on the final exam as the people on site in Bethesda. Uh, we're starting our long distance course in a couple of weeks. Uh, it runs through the spring in the north part of the globe. 
Uh, the course is offered two nights a week uh, for an hour or two each evening. In the red box on the left, you see that we also go to places to teach a course, just like we're here this week. We've been to China twice, we've been to Nigeria, we've been to Russia, we've been to India, and we're going to South Africa uh, next spring. And this has really been a, maybe the most fun part of this course, this series of courses, because every one of these has established long-term friendships, partnerships, collaborations in science, and that's what we're really hoping for. And when we visit, our hope is, is that something about what we share becomes part of a course that's self-sustaining in the place that we come to. So we're particularly excited that we have some of your young faculty serving as partners with us. Each of us has a, an assignment. They're all sitting right here. Uh, and uh, we look forward to interacting with each of those folks and being available in the future uh, if uh, it's needed. So over 30,000 students have been trained uh, since 1995 in our courses. So what about the course today? So you all have the outline in your packages, and I'm not going to spend much time on this since it's here, but you can see we're going to cover, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of clinical research, terribly biased by my own personal interests. Then we're going to uh, begin the overview of clinical study design, move into the epidemiology and observational studies, talk about the introduction of ethical principles, uh, building biorepositories and biobanks by Eduardo Abrantes later today. Let me emphasize that by clinical research, we're talking about the full spectrum from drug discovery, starting in the laboratory, going into animals, and then first in human studies, which we call T1 for translational research one, all the way through what we call T4, which is public health and modifying public policy. And that's what we're talking about. And I'll give you a little more about the definition of clinical research in a moment. Then you're going to get some more on uh, statistics, on issues of in randomization, hypothesis testing, epidemiological approach to evaluation of health problems, scientific integrity and conflicts of interest and ethics issues, sample size and power, descriptive statistics and outcome measures and response variables, therapeutic misalignment, potential impact of, on trials of existing therapies and critical illness, clinical research cooperation with NIH in the area of infectious diseases, particularly AIDS, the Brazilian experience, and documentation of your data. Then you'll get more on the conceptual approach to survival analysis, data and safety monitoring, how to report results, institutional review boards, and then a talk on translational research from science, basic science, to clinical research. And then the day five, you'll have secondary, using secondary data in statistical analysis, that's meta-analysis, particular aspects of regulatory issues in Brazil, and some summary of the content using specific examples. So the course will end with two things. First, we want you to evaluate us. And I can't emphasize that as you hear different speakers during the day, tell us right away if we got it wrong. So if we're not clear, if we're going too fast, too much detail, not enough detail, please tell us. And we will change on the fly as we're doing these presentations. So our goal is to make this a fun, useful experience. At lunchtime, we will sit with you. We're not going to sit at our own table. We want to interact with you and get feedback and uh, dialogue with you. If any of you have any questions about specific projects you might be thinking about, 
or you know, want to start chatting with us about, please feel comfortable bringing them to our attention and we'll, we'll see if we have any ideas, any, anything we might be able to add. The course will end with the final exam. We give this exam all the time uh, and we'll, we want you all to pass. We, we do have a passing score, which is 75%. Uh, we, we review the exams. Our statisticians are here to make sure that we're fair and that this is done accurately. And then we tell you right away uh, how you did. Um, so this will be given the 26. It's open book and you can use your notes. And if you get a passing score, you get a certificate, which will look something like this. I've signed them, uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Stabelli is also uh, going to be the co-signatory. They are not a degree, but you have it, and you can use it as, as, as you want. So those were my introductory comments on the course, and now let me tell you uh, in the next uh, uh, remaining time that I have a little bit about the history of clinical research, which I hope you'll realize is really emerging of diverse cultures. Clinical research is not new and it's not unique to any place. So let me start with the definition of clinical research that's used by the NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States. It's really threefold, patient-oriented research, epidemiologic and behavioral studies, and outcomes research and health services research. So patient-oriented research is much of what we're going to talk about, but certainly not all. And it's research conducted with human subjects or a material of human origin, such as tissues, specimens, and cognitive phenomena for which an investigator or colleague directly interacts with human subjects. It used to be said by a former NIH director, Harold Varmus, and that both the patient and the investigator had to be alive. But, you know, pathologists do clinical research and their subjects are not alive. I don't know about the investigators. But it's designed for the development of new technologies to study the mechanisms of human disease, therapeutic interventions, as well as clinical trials. And this is the uh, spectrum that I mentioned earlier, going from translation one to translation four, from translation to humans, um, and then to patient populations, into clinical practice, and into population health. So where did it begin? It's, it's impossible to know where it began. But I'll start here in Egypt, 2850 BC. Uh, and by the way, you all should have a disc. Did they get discs of the, no. Well, it's online. And you can get all these chapters from our textbook uh, and look at them. So Imhotep was a known scribe, chief lector, a priest, an architect, an astronomer, a magician, and magician and magics were interlinked at that time. So he did everything. And he diagnosed and treated over 200 diseases and is well documented to have performed surgery and practiced some dentistry. And he also extracted medicine from plants and he knew the position and function of the vital organs in the human body as well as uh, that there had to be some sort of circulation of blood throughout the body. So that, that's amazing, 2850 BC. Chinese also were doing work at about that same time. Uh, the Emperor Shen Nung in 2737 BC experimented with poisons and classified medical plants. And he is reputed to have eaten 365 medicinal plants over the course of his life, to have turned green and died. The father of surgery uh, is often attributable, attributed to Shishruta, who was Indian, who lived about 600 BC. And he actually wrote medical texts about surgery, his most famous being the Shishruta 
Samhita, an encyclopedia of medical learning from his day. He also counted 300 bones in the human body. Who knows how many bones there are in the human body? Any guesses? Come on, somebody knows from medical school. About 325, I think, is the right number. But that's in an adult. So if you said higher number, it's okay. Because when you're born, you have more bones, and then they fuse as you age. So, but he was remarkably ac uh, accurate. He also advocated what we call today sterilization of wounds, even though he knew nothing about infectious diseases. And he talked about instruments to do surgery and very clearly said that the best instrument was the human hand. So you can find an experiment in the Old Testament uh, and in uh, the book of Daniel, for those of you who know that. And uh, this quote comes from the book of Daniel about the third paragraph. Uh, it says, uh, he was uh, captured by the Egyptians as, as a Jew and was uh, worried about having to be put in eat all this terrible food. So he said to the steward, test your servants for 10 days and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's rich food be observed by you. And according to what you see, deal with your servants. And what happened is they did this test for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's rich food. So the steward took away their rich food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables so they'd be better workers. And that was, you know, without informed consent. <laughs> so obviously one of the true great uh, uh, leaders in clinical research was Hippocrates, who was born about 460 BC and died about 370 BC. We all know the Hippocratic method, but Hippocrates was a phenomenal observer and a great, he wrote, a great part of the art is the ability to observe. And let me just read to you what he wrote about pulmonary edema. Uh, he had about 420 different case reports which you can read which I've had the pleasure of reading many. He said, description of pulmonary edema, water accumulates, the patient has fever and cough, the respiration is fast, the feet become edematous, the nails appeal curved, clubbing, and the patient suffers as if he has pus inside, only less severe and more protracted. One can recognize that it is not pus but water. If you put your ear against the chest, you can hear it seethe inside like sour wine. So, a phenomenal observer, uh, look at the date, and he, you just have to read these uh, case reports because one is better than the other. He also dissociated medicine from theology and philosophy. He established the science of medicine and, of course, he provided physicians with the highest moral inspiration they have. And he had a true appreciation for wound management. He said, if water was used for irrigation, it had to be very pure or boiled, and the hands and nails of the operator were to be cleansed. Again, remember the date. So Hippocrates was a true giant. So as I go through these slides, I'm going to try to grab snippets from every culture. And if I miss one, you have to tell me. So the next time I, I, I try to be fair. So Al Razi from Iran uh, lived later, about 865 to 925. And he was, to my knowledge, one of the first to recommend alcohol as an antiseptic, but not the first. Hippocrates did that too. He made contributions to medicine, alchemy, and philosophy. And he wrote the first treatise on pediatrics and he wrote about 184 books and articles. Shortly after him was Ibn Sina of Avincia, 
a leader in pharmacy, philosophy, and medicine, and pharmacology, and he wrote the Canon of Medicine, which was the main medical textbook in Europe from the 14th to the 16th centuries. Um, and it, his book contains a known treatise on uh, clinical trials. And let me show you what this Canon of Medicine articulated, because it's so appropriate even today. He said, if you want to study a drug, first it has to be pure. This is before they had any chemistry for purifying drugs. He said, the drug must be tested for only one condition at a time. Drugs must be tested in contradictory disease states. The strength of a drug must be proportionate to the severity of the diseases. The time of therapeutic effect must be considered. The drug must be observed for continued action and the drug must be tested in humans before any judgment can be made. Again, remember the date when this was done. So now we're gonna jump ahead a few centuries, and I just, since I have an interest in infectious diseases, that's my background, I have to tell you, if you don't know, about Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope, uh, and he described a lot of things, but you may not realize he described protozoa, bacteria, the striated muscle, the crystalline lens of the eye, red cells, and sperm. Hematology emerged in the uh, 15 to 1600s. William Harvey described uh, in detail the circulatory system. So Christopher Wren, who was a great architect, was also a, an, uh, an anatomist, a drawer, but he also delivered the first intravenous injection in dogs. He took the dog bladder and the urethra and hooked a needle which he made up to it and gave opium to dogs intravenously. And after that, he worked with his friends, Richard Lauer and Edmund King, because they wanted to deliver blood to people who were bleeding. And the first blood transfusion was made possible by the work of Christopher Wren. And fortunately, by luck, they had proper typing and the patient did well. Maybe the first clinical trial was by James Lind, who was in the British Navy as a medical officer. And he was interested in scurvy, which was a major health problem for the British Navy in the 1700s. William Harvey, before him, had recommended lemons to treat scurvy, but had argued that the therapeutic effect was a result of the acid in the fruit. Lind conducted a trial in 1747 to assess the utility of three therapies for scurvy. He took 12 sailors with classical scurvy, divided them into six groups of two each, all given identical diets, the various groups supplemented with vinegar, dilute sulfuric acid, cider, seawater, nutmeg, garlic, and horseradish mixture, or two oranges and one lemon daily. And here are the results. Okay? Nothing is significant. But he didn't worry about statistics in those days. You're going to learn to worry about statistics. Your best friends are going to be your statisticians. But he was right. The two patients who got the citrus fruit got better. And he became famous <laughs> and had a paper published, even though none of it was significant. Let me just touch on the story of smallpox. Smallpox goes back a long way. Al Razi described it, we think the first description, about 900 AD. In the 11th century, protective measures for Smallpox were, were described. They included putting scabs from smallpox pustules of one patient into the nostrils of a healthy individual. Wearing the clothing of someone who had the disease. Ingesting powdered fleas from infected cows, which may have perceived the relationship of cowpox to smallpox. So these first things were what we uh, later call variolation, that is taking a pus or something from an infected individual and inoculating 
a healthy person. Some people died because they got smallpox, but most people were protected. And of course, the first clinical trial of using the cowpox was by James Jenner, and here's a picture on the left of him vaccinating a small child. And uh, the reason his work was so famous was not because it was the first, but it was the first clinical trial that was carefully designed and proved beyond any question that the vaccine worked. And it was rapidly accepted throughout the world, Europe and then the United States and elsewhere. And of course, smallpox has been eradicated. Genetics, you all know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Mendel but his work uh, was uh, so important to what is today one of the major drivers of clinical research throughout the world. And of course Darwin, who uh, described evolution, and if you didn't know, was very nervous about publishing his results because he was a religious man his, and his parents actually wanted him to be a priest and he didn't do it. And he waited and waited and waited and it wasn't until he learned that a, another person was about to publish the same story that he published it. And, uh, and uh, we have that wonderful story. So epidemiology you're going to hear a lot about in the next few days and I think the beginning may be John Snow who was born in York, England. Uh, he was a physician, an anesthesiologist and a hygiene pioneer, and his work was about cholera in Soho, England in 1854. And he drew this map, a dot map, where each dot represents a patient who got cholera in this community. And he concluded that all these dots were around the center of this red circle, which was a, a well, a pump. And he concluded that there was something in the water that was bad that was causing an infection and he told the folks, close the well and the epidemic will go away. And they closed the well, the epidemic went away, but the people got very angry because they had to travel a long distance to get water. So they reopened the well and the cholera came back, did the same thing, anyway, beginning of epidemiology. But clearly, in my mind, one of the most important public health advances is still something we struggle with today, at least in my hospital, washing hands, making people wash hands. And Sistrida, as I mentioned, he had advocated this, as did Hippocrates. But the person who really um, made this clearly uh, definitive that you had to wash your hands was Ignaz Semmelweis, who was born in Budapest, Hungary, 1818. And he studied purple sepsis. He was an obstetrician. And he did it in Vienna over the protests of his chief, who thought this was ridiculous. Because he noted the sepsis rate was three times higher in Division I in his hospital than in Division II. These two divisions were identical, except medical students worked in Division I and midwives worked in Division II. And he had a death of a friend who was a pathologist who died of a disease that looked just like purple sepsis clinically, and he concluded there must be something carried from the autopsy room to the women when they were delivering babies. So he had the students wash their hands with lime juice. And there's the basin, it still exists, that they use. And the mortality rate dropped from 18% to 1%, and in some months, in 1848, it was zero. And these are the data. These are the mortality rates on the unit. The yellow line is the mortality rates. The red arrow is when they started washing hands. And you don't have to be too smart to see that something happened. Well, his chief didn't believe his data and he got fired. Uh, so he moved back to Budapest and he set the experiments up again and he repeated them and got the same results. So he wrote a paper and nobody would accept it. So if your papers don't get accepted, you know, it's happened in the past. You just got to keep trying. And eventually he paid to get his own paper published because no journal would publish it. He went crazy. He went to a mental institution. He cut his foot on a 
rusty bed, and he died of something that looked like purple sepsis. Very sad outcome. There was a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was an obstetrician at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, who knew about his work and promoted it, at least throughout the United States, and soon washing hands became generally accepted. I can tell you, on our hospital, this past year and a half, we had infections with a multi-drug-resistant Klebsiella. Seven patients died. And the thing that made the major difference was when we hired people to watch people wash their hands. We actually continued to do that. So you have to constantly train people to wash their hands when they go into and out of a patient's room, particularly someone who has an infection. So let me tell you briefly about the birth of the pharmaceutical industry. Lots of key people. One of them that I'll mention is Rudolf Virchow, who lived in Poland, who described leukemia. But he also said, omnis cellulari a cellula. Every cell originates from another cell. Beginning of stem cells, the concept of stem cells. And um, he also described pulmonary emboli, thrombosis, and embolism. But for our purposes, for the beginning of the pharmaceutical industry, think cells. Cell therapy is where a lot of the pharmaceutical industry is going. Lots of exciting challenges uh, with cell therapy. Pasteur, who is my, one of my personal historical figures, uh, champions, he was born in France. As you know, he described the germ basis of fermentation, the germ theory of infectious disease. He discovered staphylococci as a cause of boils. He described streptococcus pyogenes as the cause of purple sepsis that Semmelweis had worked on. He developed a vaccine for anthrax. He developed a vaccine for rabies. In addition to describing DNL isomers and things like that and saving the wine industry and the silk industry in France. Um, one thing I'll just point out to you, if you notice, those of you who are astute clinicians, his right arm is sort of just hanging there. He had a stroke early in life and had really no use of his right arm but still was able to make all those great discoveries. This is Barry, who was German. He discovered antibodies, particularly for diphtheria antitoxin. He was the very first person to use passive immunization, which is being used in patients who have Ebola. That is taking serum or plasma from patients who've survived and giving it to patients who are actively infected. We don't know if it works, but it's being done. He received the first Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine for his work on serum therapy, especially its application against diphtheria. Pasteur would have won it, but he was dead and, uh, when the Nobel Prize was started, so they did not give it posthumously. Paul Ehrlich was phenomenally important in the pharmaceutical industry development. When he was a medical student, he described the eosinophils. He described the complement pathway and all of its importance in humoral immunity and won a Nobel Prize for that, but he also was the first to treat syphilis. He and his technician, Sahashiro Hata, uh, described salvar salvarsin, which was a hoax product, and arsenobenzene, which uh, was 32% arsenic and was toxic. And later he developed a second agent, neosalvarin, salvarsin, or compound 914. And this had therapeutic effects against syphilis and was probably the first uh, antibiotic uh, to work. Oh. He also wrote, we must search for magic bullets. We must strike the parasites and the parasites alone. And to do this, we must learn to aim with chemical substances. So Alexander Fleming, the discovery of penicillin in 1928 while working on the influenza virus. Serendipity is so important. 
He observed mold on a staff culture plate with a bacteria-free circle around it. And then he recognized and discovered penicillin, which was in that zone, inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1945, and that was the beginning of real big-time antibiotics. The insulin story is a fascinating story, if you haven't heard it. Uh, in 1921, uh, there were two investigators, Fred Banting and Charles Best, who were working in a lab and their boss was away on vacation for the summer. And so the two of them started extracting material from the islets of Langerhans from the pancreas, which they called insulin from Latin for island. And they gave it to a diabetic dog and they cured that dog of diabetes. Within six weeks, they had this stuff purified before their boss came back from his vacation. And they gave it to a 14-year-old boy dying of diabetes and it lowered the blood sugar and cleared the urine of sugars and other signs of disease and was immediately recognized as a treatment for diabetes. So what happened? Banting, the boss, came back from his vacation and won the Nobel Prize with Best. Now we can spend a lot of time talking about that. And the technician, uh, uh, no, I mean they published the paper, it was McLeod who came back. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize with Banting who had a degree, but Best who did not have a degree and was a technician, did not receive the Nobel Prize. They shared the money with him, but it was not a good story. And, uh, uh, and that was the beginning of, the, of, of drugs. So in view of the, the, the time running late, I think that, do um, uh, uh, you think I have some more time? Oh, all right, well then I'll finish. So let me tell you about women in clinical research since uh, you haven't seen any yet, and that's because I couldn't find any. Uh, Florence Nightingale, a nurse, uh, was born in Italy. Um, she was an, a very accomplished mathematician, but her parents told her that being a mathematician as a girl was not the right thing to do. So she became a nurse, but she, uh, she was very concerned about infection rates in war hospitals. And she recognized the importance of designing hospitals properly with good airflow and separating patients uh, from each other. And in the Crimean War, her contributions had a huge impact in reducing uh, infection in that uh, war hospital setting. Perhaps the most famous woman from the uh, 1800s and 1900s was Marie Curie, who with her husband discovered radium. They realized that radioactivity was an intrinsic property of matter and won the Nobel Prize for that. But you may not realize that she pioneered a mobile x-ray unit for the French Army in World War I. She found a radiologic school for nurses. And she received a second Nobel Prize in recognition of further work she did on radioactivity. And her daughter Irene also won a Nobel Prize with her husband uh, for the discovery of artificial radioactivity. So this was quite a family lineage. Uh, who was the first person to do blind studies? Well, it was someone you won't expect, and maybe many of you never heard of him, but those who were Americans will know him. Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin was one of our early leaders of the American Revolution, a real scholar. And he was sent over before the Revolutionary War to France as the ambassador of the colonies and to try to get the French interested in helping the revolutionaries. And in 1784, King Louis XVI of France asked Franklin to help him with a problem that he had. His problem was that a lot of his citizens were hugging the trees in Versailles, and he was embarrassed by that. And they claimed they were hugging the trees because there was this magic force that was issued from the trees that cured all illness. So Franklin appointed a committee to study what was called animal magnetism. And 
he and his committee, which include guillotine of the knife and all sorts of famous people, started hugging trees and they realized they couldn't, they couldn't figure anything out. So they decided to sit in, not them, but to bring in 430 people into their room and blindfold them and give them pieces of the trees or other objects. And they very carefully described what happened to all these uh, 430 or so people. And they concluded the trees didn't work. So that was the first blinded study. But he did something else. He recognized the placebo effect. And he wrote about it in this paper that was um, published on animal magnetism. So he was the first one who also described that lightning causes electricity. And he did all sorts of things like that. But he, he described blinding studies and the placebo effect. And then Torrid Stallman in 1930 suggested a placebo controlled and blind a, blind observer as a solution to investigator bias and blindfold tests were widely used by the cosmetic industry in the United States for testing whether or not cosmetics had an effect. What about statistics? And you're going to hear about randomization and uh, uh, in my reading Sir Ronald Amler Fisher uh, really was one of the first to do this but he was interested in agriculture and he introduced the application of statistics to experimental design in, in terms of um, uh, rotating crops and, and, and uh, uh, whether or not it really worked. The first clinical trial with a properly randomized control study, this is different from Lynn's study, uh, was done in the first use of streptomycin for treatment of tuberculosis. Uh, in a study led by Austin Bradford Hill in 1948. And if you want to read a great paper about both the first treatment of tuberculosis and randomization, uh, a controlled trial, read this one. So medical research ethics, you're going to learn a, a lot about that from Dr. Grady, and I'm just going to give you two examples of things that happened historically that relate to this. The first I'm going to mention is by the discoverer of the leprosy bacillus, Gerhard Hansen, who was a Norwegian. And he discovered Mycobacterium lepra in 1873 and felt that it was the cause of leprosy, but he was having a lot of trouble proving it. And so what he did is he inoculated some patients with live organism, and they got leprosy. And he got fired. <laughs> Uh, because it was viewed as horrible that someone would inoculate someone with a live agent without telling them. He didn't tell these people that they were getting inoculated. The second, uh, the next example that I'll give you was in 1898 by William Osler at a medical meeting in the United States in response to an oral presentation by Giuseppe Sanarelli on the discovery of the etiologic agent for yellow fever who injected this agent into volunteers, again, without telling them what he was doing. And Osler said to deliberately inject a poison of known high degree of virulency into a human being, unless you obtain a man's sanction is criminal. And that was the end of Santarelli's career. So informed consent is very dear to us at the uh, place I work, because in, at least in the United States, we think the formalization of informed consent actually happened at the f beginnings of it, happened at the first medical board meeting of our hospital in 1953, when the medical board at the very first meeting said, how do we provide each patient with a reasonable understanding of his role in a study project and the means of obtaining evidence of such understanding and consent? This kind of thinking uh, led in 1962 to our Congress to amend the Food and Drug Act stipulating subjects must be told whether a drug is being used for investigational purposes and later on the Surgeon General of the United States uh, established uh, the institutional review boards uh, to review all grants 
uh, given out by the government in, in our country. So th that sort of brings you up to date on that. Uh, and I'll let um, Christine Grady tell you a little bit more about the uh, Nuremberg trials and others. So I'm going to end with just a, a, a few vignettes so you don't think I forgot about Brazil. Uh, so there's uh, uh, several things that are higher in my mind of accomplishments that Brazil contributed to the world in terms of clinical research related to malaria, dengue, leishmaniasis, or calorizar, TB, leprosy, Chagas disease, and AIDS, particularly AIDS, where I think this country was the leader in the developing world for how to get AIDS drugs to uh, uh, patients in a meaningful way and make a big difference. So malaria is an ancient disease. Uh, again, in China, in 2700 BC, uh, were they were described. Uh, the plant Artemisia annua was described in ancient China as having a they believed the substance that would protect against malaria. And in 340 AD, the anti-fever properties for malaria of Ginkoa was first described by Ji Hang in the East Yin Dynasty. And the active ingredient of that was isolated by Tu Yuyu in 1971. It took a little while. And Tu Yuyu won the last award a few years ago in, 19, in 2011 for describing artemisin, which as you all know is a very important malaria drug, which is beginning to get resistance to that agent, but uh, it's, it's a long story. Nangi uh, was described around 400 AD, again in China. It swept across Asia, Africa, and North America in the mid-1700s. In 1906, it, transmission by Aedes mosquitoes was confirmed. In 1907, John Cleland and Joseph Siller uh, completed the basic understanding of dengue transmission, and today we know there are four different viruses that cause this hemorrhagic fever. Calorizar, or Leishmaniasis, was first described the 7th century BC. Uh, the cutaneous form was described in Ecuador and Peru in pre inca potteries. It's uh, depicted in skin lesions and deformed facies. In the mid 18th century, Africa and India reports describe the disease now known as visceral Leishmaniasis, or Cal Azar or black fever. And in 1901, William Leishman, a doctor in the British Army, develops specific stains for the ovoid bodies of Leishmania. And Charles Donovan recognized these symptoms of the disease. And they published a paper together defining or describing Leishmania Donovani. So, one of the people who uh, won the Nobel Prize was Robert Koch, who you know had Koch's postulates. He also, uh, in 18, uh, late 1800s, introduced the Petri dish, the use of blood agar pore plates. He described anthrax. He also was the first person to culture tuberculosis. He described waterborne epidemics. And he won the Nobel Prize for his research and discoveries related to tuberculosis. He also developed the first skin test, the DPT skin test for tuberculosis. So Chagas, and uh, one of the most important, uh, the most important uh, uh, person in the area of trypanosomiasis, uh, he discovered Chagas disease, uh, described in detail the pathogen, the vector, the host clinical manifestations, the epidemiology of the disease. But he also was the first to discover and illustrate pneumocystis, which, as you all know, was later linked as a major pathogen in AIDS. Uh, so we're very grateful to Chagas and all the things he did here in Brazil. And 
Lastly, I just wanted to mention AIDS. The first Brazilian case of AIDS was described in 1982, just at the beginning of the world epidemic. And then the infection rates here, like elsewhere, climbed exponentially in the 1980s. But by 2002, Brazil was the world leader in medication access and all patients worldwide got these antiretroviral viral treatments, but they were really begun here in Brazil in a major way. Um, so it was the most successful and largest anti-AIDS treatment, and it's frequently cited as the model for all developing countries for how to do that. And uh, progressive social policies toward risk groups were established and the uh, partnerships with non-governmental organizations were established. So over 80% of the people in need of treatment by 2011 receive it here in Brazil. A really amazing accomplishment. So I could go on, I could talk about the Brazilian work on human papillomavirus, which is truly outstanding. Uh, but I won't because we need to go on now and learn about the uh, challenges and issues uh, that you all need to know to become leaders in the clinical research arena. Uh, but I hope you go away remembering that clinical research really can be traced to all cultures. Isaac Newton once said that if he could see further than others, it was because he was standing on the shoulders of giants looking out. And I think all of you have uh, a wonderful uh, historical army of people to shoulders you can stand on as you look into the, the future. And training is important, and it's important not only for learning about the business of clinical research, but it's also important to establish partnerships not only among yourselves, but internationally as we partner and I look forward to the partnerships between the National Institutes of Health and you all. And I'm going to end by just telling you that there's a new partnership program with the Clinical Center, the place I work, that you all are available to access. This is a grant. It's called a UO1 grant, which is just a collaboration. It's a large grant. It's about a half a million dollars a year, $500,000 a year for three years renewable for a partnership between an outside investigator, could come from Brazil, could come from anywhere in the United States, and someone at the clinical center. If you have an idea and you want to pursue that, please email me and I will try to help you uh, figure out how to make that happen. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us and we look forward to um, uh, this week of learning with you.